Thanks, Takalani. No, I don't need that. I got it on my face. Uh, evening, ladies and gents. Uh, I'm not sure if I did quite as well as Takalani promised, but um, I'm going to mark myself in a, in a moment. So, so Warren Buffett says it best. Predictions tell you more about the person making the prediction than actually about what will happen in the future. And this is my disclaimer up front. My ability to see into the future is exactly the same as yours. Zero. Absolutely zero. However, I get given the stage to pontificate and, and, and make ideas, and I will, as far as possible, support those theories with my logic behind it. Uh, there is time for questions, and you're welcome to poke as many holes as possible, because I'm certainly not married to them. I'm certainly not stating that it is this way or the highway. Uh, there are many ways that 2015 can play out. And I'm looking at, at, at fairly uh, broad trends, because that uh, gives me a little more wiggle room when I come to mark myself in a year's time, rather than saying Richmond will be 109 Rand and 12 cents, I'll tell you to buy Richmond for the long term and leave it to your grandchildren and you'll make money. And I'll probably be right over the next 50 years. Uh, there were my 2014 trends. I said Fed would end QE and that the world would not end. And I was right in both of those. Um, I said that the Rand would weaken. I was right. I said it would weaken to 12 Rand 50. I was wrong. And it's, it, it, that was an important point for me. From about 2004 up until beginning of, of this year, late last year, I had been calling for a stronger rand, a rand to move stronger, largely based on the inflows of, of, of currency into South Africa, dollars and the like, and, and pretty much that worked. There were occasional blip outs. We saw the, the, the move to 11 odd in uh, 2008 with the, with the financial crisis, but pretty much the currency had been strengthening for almost a decade. In the beginning of this year, it, 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 things are changing, and I'll talk more about why it's important and what that shift is. But I, certainly for me to say the RAND was going to weaken was, 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 was a strategic shift in my thinking, um, I, but it didn't weaken as much as I had thought it would. I told you to sell gold. I told you it was a relic. I told you it was a completely useless investment. I told you that the world ends what you want is water and pumpkin seeds, not gold bars. I was right about the gold bars. My water and pumpkin seed hypothesis hasn't yet been tested. Although we did land on a comet yesterday. Now, we've all seen the movie. The question is, anyone seen Bruce Willis recently? I mean, we assume he's up there saving us, isn't he? Um, and I also told you that Bitcoin was great fun, but far too volatile. I told you to buy a platinum. You okay. Um, I got it wrong, and I've even got a good reason why I got it wrong. And that's always a real cop-out when I tell you my excuse. But the, the, the excuse is actually quite important. And I still hold platinum. I did buy it. I own it. And um, I am underwater. Uh, saved a little bit by weaker currency. but So the story behind Platinum was quite compelling. That story, as put out by John C Johnson Matthey and others and the Platinum miners, was that the global supply-demand balance of Platinum was almost pretty much in equilibrium. And that as the global economy recovered, we would start to see the demand side pick up and supply not pick up as fast, and therefore that pushes the price higher. That's basic economics 101. We then go into a five-month platinum strike this year, in which immediately you think, brilliant. Uh, supply is disappearing off the face of the earth. Demand goes nowhere. Price goes through the roof. And it didn't. We had a five-month platinum strike. Nothing happened to the platinum price. It went sideways. And then you start to think something's fundamentally wrong here. And then you start digging around. And you discover that the, made, the three biggest platinum miners in the world Anglo Platinum, Inplats, and to a lesser degree, Lonman, have been stockpiling platinum above ground. So when we had the five-month strike, what were they doing? They were selling platinum into the market to meet demand and to make revenue for their shareholders. Nice. But what it means is that all those years when we thought the balance between supply and demand was at sort of break-even point, it was only at break-even because the platinum miners were buying their own platinum. In other words, they were scamming the numbers. Ah, okay, not scamming, it's perfectly legal. But for example, Anglo Platinum will tell you that we mined 2.4 million ounces of platinum and we sold uh, 200, 2 million ounces of platinum, 400,000 ounces of platinum they kept back. And that was great. I mean, it's good management. It meant during the strike they had capacity, they could sell. What it does mean is that the platinum market is not in balance. The platinum market is in oversupply as is every other commodity. So we got hoodwinked. 
That's fine. We get hoodwinked, and I'm going to talk more about commodities. I got that wrong. I said interest rates would remain unchanged, and you're going to tell me, no, no, your bond is costing you more. Yeah, in South Africa, we had little, little bit increases um, off, off uh, multi-decade lows. I'm looking more at a global picture. Interest rate increases in South Africa, fairly modest. We are still sitting with interest rates at 30-year lows, which is significant, means for cheap money. And globally, we saw no move in interest rates whatsoever, unless they were going down. One exception was Sweden. They took their interest rate from, I think, half a percent to 2%, and then they took it back to zero. So if anything, there was a move, but actually it went weaker in time. They realized they made a mistake. And then my big mess up, the, the, the one I got completely wrong was, I said, at best, the JSC will be flat, assuming that the RAND is weak. Weak RAND, we'll get a flat JSC, best we can hope for. To be honest, I'm too scared to look at what the JC has done year to date, but I do know it is not flat. It is green. It's probably 10, 12, 14% up to year to date. And I get the story. The story is quite simple. 75% of earnings of the JSC top 40 come offshore. Ergo, forget looking at South Africa, look global. I, I understand that. I appreciate that. I still stand here a little bit gobsmacked that the JSC is up double digit numbers for the year. Bottom line is I got more right than wrong, uh, so, so I think that, that gives me credibility to come back here, but it does mean that pick and choose which ones you think I'm right about for 2015 because like, I got only just slightly more than half right. But in the South African school matric, that's probably almost an A. So 2015, I'm going to start with some very, very easy ones. I know, sorry, first, I, I want to touch this. I talked about it last year as well. There's always going to be hype. There's always going to be panic. There's always going to be people telling you markets will crash. They will crash. The, the funnest part of the pullback in, in, in October was everyone had been telling us our market is overvalued. Everyone had been telling us we deserve a correction. And then it comes and there's like main large amounts of panic. And corrections are good things. That correction was only about 13%. I kept on saying I wanted a whole, I wanted the top 40 at 40,000. I think we bottomed at about 42. The thing is, we got the correction. What do people do? They sold. What should we do? It's called a sale, guys. We go and buy stuff. You go and buy the quality when it's a little bit cheaper. And I missed some. I, I was saying before, I had a, a cheeky bid on ShopRite at 129 and it never got there. Um, but I, when, when markets are coming down, you go and buy the stuff that you like. And does that mean that they won't go cheaper? No, heck no, they go cheaper anyway. But we got the correction we were looking for. The point is, you will hear the talk around crashes. If you, you, know, you go to the right website, you will hear the talk around the end of the world. You will hear the talk around you must sell everything because things are, the wheels are falling off. You will always hear that. That is not new. That is not fun. And I'm never going to stand up here and tell you that a market crash is coming. It is definitely without a shadow of a doubt. But the important part is when. And without the when, it's irrelevant. And if the logic is when markets are expensive, you sell, well, then you would have sold two years ago and you would have lost out on about approximately, I'm trying to run the math, about 30% upside in the process. So we're now for 30% and we're back to where you were two years ago when you sold, you took a tax hit two years ago when you sold, and you've missed out on 24 months worth of dividends. Key point, my quality portfolio, I hold it forever. I don't worry about these small time, small time fluctuations. So and, and there will be a crash at some point. And in fact, just last week, we had the uh, anniversary of the crash of 1929. But so onto the predictions, we start with the easy one, ESCOM. We will have power outages in 2015. The question is not, will we have them? The question is, how many? Our grid is under strain. Madupi does not save us. Madupi comes online in full capacity in 2019. Madupi has not enough power to save our sorry country at this point in time. We need Kassilia, and Kassilia is scheduled for 2019, which means 2024. This power crisis is a decade still to play. This is a humongous implication for us as a country. It is costing us, I saw a tweet the other day, someone said it had cost us 300 billion of GDP. Nonsense. It's cost us 3 trillion of GDP. It's cost us so far in the eight years, it's probably cost us an entire year of GDP. Think about it. You are a person somewhere on planet Earth and you want to build a factory, a manufacturing plant. You want to open a business and you can go to any one of the 212 countries or depending how things are going in certain parts of the world, it might be 211 or 213. You can pick any country. Typically, what's the first question you ask? Do we have power? And the answer for South Africa is no. So what do you do? Draw a line, go to the next country. That's what's happening in South Africa. We do not have security of power. And we are not going to have it for another decade. 
So as individuals, it's really easy. For about 60,000 Rand, you put panels on your roof, you get your own power, you get off the grid, you ignore ESCOM, you make coffee whenever you want, and they pay themselves back in about four and a half years because of the electrical increases. For business, you are in serious trouble. And we see it quite simply in our GDP. And the one thing you notice about GDP is a year ago, there were economists out there who were forecasting 2% GDP, but were too scared to mention it live in any live environment. So they were saying, well, we think now we, we, we're going to do one and a half at best. And that's this year. Next year is going to be worse. The ESCOM story is bad. It is incredibly bad for SA Inc. Don't misconstrue SA Inc. with the JSC. What this means is that companies that are making most of their money in South Africa are in trouble. Companies that are making their money beyond the borders in South Africa are not in so much trouble. And this doesn't go away in a hurry. It's the biggest mistake we as human beings make. We think, think, we think things happen quickly. I remember chatting with Maya Fisher French on CNBC in 2008, late 2008, and she had read a report that said that the power crisis would be over sometime around 2015 or so. I remember thinking, yeah, that, that, that's impossibly far away. Turns out she was wrong by about a decade, but this is not going to change in a hurry. And then on to the next very, very, sorry, I'll start with the gloomy stuff. It gets less gloomy in a moment. Kasatu and Numsa. This is massively significant to us. From a political perspective, it is the break of, breakup of the tripartite alliance which I think is a good thing, and I think it's a good thing because I think Labour should stand outside of government to agitate government. Labour should be standing on the streets outside Parliament, uh, protesting and shaking their fists, rather than stay, sitting inside Parliament with government. Because otherwise, who the heck's representing Labour? Somebody has to be representing Labour. This should have happened 20 years ago. Our leaders, for whatever reason, didn't do it. It is happening now. A couple of massive implications. It is going to split up. Kusatu will break in half, essentially. We will get the one bunch go off on their own uh, and Kusatu left behind. And then what happens, for example, NUMSA, National Union of Metal Workers of South Africa, Kusatu will start a competing union. How do unions compete? Militancy. Forget 12 and a half thousand rand wage requests. How about 15 or 18 or 20? Forget, you know, 30% salary increases, how about 50% salary increases? You get unions or workers to sign up for your union by being more extreme and militant. We've seen it already, AMCU and NUM. That was a struggle for union members. AMCU won. AMCU won for an interesting reason. A, a bunch of them, partly that, that NUM had lost their way and been co-opted by, by capital. But AMCU went out and said, we want 12,500 rand. And that's a number which means something. As opposed to NUM, who goes out and says we want 17%, which is a completely abstract, meaningless number. So part of it was simple, and, and this is what politics is. I mean, politics is, is common denominator stuff. Politics is sloganeering. That's what it's about. And that's why AMCU were able to completely beat the heck out of NUM. So NUM is now a has-been union. The fights will continue a bit, but we're going to see it spreading to the other sectors of the industry. Very interestingly, of the, of the unions that support NUMSA, one of them is the uh, National Union of Football Players. It's going to be interesting when we have a competing National Union of Football Players union watching those derbies down in Soweto, but that's another story entirely. However, this split between Kusatu and NUMSA is only half of the story. The EFF is the other half. And I especially include the cocktail party there because the disconnect between the black power symbol with the uh, spear and then they have a cocktail party weirdness in politics and this is not exclusive to south africa politics is just weird the eff is is is, is agitating like we have never seen before i mean what they are doing in parliament is, you know people are saying it's unparliamentary well i mean maybe it is maybe it isn't who really cares the point is you know they're the only people who are actually really calling jacob zuma to account whether he deserves to or not not into that, that debate. The point is they're standing there and actually calling him to account, pay back the money. They're shutting down the system because they're saying it's rotten from the top up. Whether you agree with them, whether you voted for them, doesn't matter. The point is that they are on the streets and being pointy with their elbows. And that then plays in to the Kusatu uh, Numsa split.
And then we have a couple of very interesting nuances within the space. Uh, EFF, very, very Marxist, very, very top down, Commander Malema, et cetera, et cetera. Ultimately, the EFF will, will, will collapse in a heap and disappear and will be a footnote in history. NUMS is the real story because they're proper grassroots, they're proper workers. EFF is not workers supporting. Yeah, come on. I mean, Julius Malema wears a quarter of a million rand watches. That's why Kasatu is splitting up because. The people who supposedly support Labour wear quarter of a million rand watches, and, and, and Julius Malema is actually on that side more than on the proper worker side. Ultimately, what we'll get is NUMSA will get a left-wing party to the left of the ANC, because whatever you say, the ANC is not radical, they are not leftist, the ANC and the DA are, are the same thing, broadly, they are centrist parties, they are centrist in their mandates, in their economics, and I think one day they will merge and we will have a NUMSA on the one, a Labour party and a centrist party, and the centrist will broadly win. But what this means is that operating in South Africa for the next many years while this shakes out is going to be tough. If you've got a manufacturing business without your electricity and your workers threatening to strike because they want 30% salary increases or 18,000 rand, etc., it is going to be exceedingly tough for SA Inc. to operate in this space right now across all sectors that are in South Africa. So short answer, the one or one and a half percent GDP that we're going to see in 2014, frankly, is going to be about as good as it gets for the next three or four years. It's not, we're not going to suddenly get that magic 5% number that everyone talks about. We're not going to suddenly find that, that, that policies are suddenly creating vast amounts of job and GDP growth. It's just not possible. We have a structural issue at the base of the economy. We have labor fighting with labor and then fighting with capital. And capital hasn't got the power to turn the lights on. That is not an economy that is booming forward by any stretch of imagination. So local economy is going to have it exceedingly tough. It's just it's not going to be particularly fun in the space whatsoever. So that's the really, really bad part. The good part is that most of our companies are global. Many of them are going global. And you want to find companies that have gone global and are making a large amount of their money offshore for two reasons. One, it's going to be real tough local. And two, I think we're going to see a week around still further. In fact, I'll probably put my head in the block and say 12.50 again. You know, if you say something often enough, eventually you proved right. You just ask Clive Roffey and the gold price. So we're looking for companies that are going global. Now, some of them did it really early in their process. You know, ShopRite went into the rest of Africa over a decade ago. Um, some of them have done, you know, Aspen is another example that springs to mind. Richmond, apart from a couple of wash watches they sold to the EFF and the like, they're not many quarter of a million rand watches that they get to sell in South Africa. Some of them are late to the party. In Victor, case in point. I mean, they went into South Korea two years ago, they are late to that, to that expansion party. Um, others, it's less of an issue. Zeta, we need food. That doesn't really matter that their expansion is late. But you want companies that are already well established internationally. So that they can, they, they've got the footprint on the ground. They can start to grow it. Uh, Breit's an example. You know, they've got Pepcor and the like locally, and I quite like the Pepcor story. Um, Low-income workers, it's low LSMs, it's a great story. What they've also got is, for example, Icelandic Foods. Now, they've already got Icelandic Foods is, I think, 1,400 stores. I mean, that's a giant chain in the UK. So companies that are telling you we are going overseas, sorry, guys, that boat sailed. You should have done it a decade ago. You want companies who are telling you we are overseas, we're doing great, we're making large amounts of money. Those are the folks we want to focus on because they're going to continue to make profits because they're in high GDP growth areas. On top of that, they grow their business, they get a double whammy, and then they get a weaker currency and they get a triple whammy. So you want those companies that are already offshore. If they're not offshore already, they've missed the party. And we, we see a lot of them in that space. There's an important point we then have to understand here. Of the top 40, 75% of the profits, as I said, and it's about 70, maybe it's 70, maybe it's 77, about three quarters of profits is generated in, in, offshore. The companies that are listed that are exclusively onshore are your small caps, to a lesser degree, mid caps. They're the ones who are really, really going to struggle. And it's the small cap guys, you know, Accentuate springs to mind, who sell flooring in South Africa. They only sell flooring. They only do it in South Africa. They have no revenue beyond the borders of, 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 of South Africa. It's those sort of listed companies who are going to find it tougher and tougher going forward. There are exceptions. Afrimat results of a few weeks ago were brilliant. And you listen um, to, to Andres van Heerden, the CEO. 
And he says, they're rocking, they're rolling, they're doing great. But Afrimat is a, is a, is a unique business. It, it's a brilliantly well-managed business. They buy brilliant assets. And the point is they sell stones. And when you're selling stones, what matters is where your stones are because it is expensive to move them to where you are needed. Andres understands that, so he bought his quarries in clever places. He's less worried about the quality of the quarry. He is worried about the quality of the quarry, but he's as worried about the location of the quarry. And he will also take a small job. He will take an 80 million rand job. My and Roberts are like 80 million. No, 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 no. That's my bonus. You've got to be kidding me. We need, we need real jobs. We need billions and trillions and et cetera, et cetera. Andres is like 80 million. You know what? If I can do it at a profit, I'd do it. So there are exceptions, but they're going to be fewer and far between. Most of the small guys, local, Bola Metcalf, and I mean, you know, Bola Metcalf do uh, uh, in injection molding. So they make fancy plastic bottles and the like, uh, the PET bottles, we get our water in, probably that bottle that my blue juice is in and the like. Very lacquer, but they do it in South Africa. It's a tough space to be. Consumers under pressure, economy under pressure, they're simply going to be selling less. They're a brilliantly run company, but they're just in a, in a, in a tough economic environment right now. And the RAND is, in essence, our canary in the gold mine. Theory about the canary in the gold mine, when the carbon dioxide levels rose too high, the canary died first, so when the canary fell over, you knew it was time to get the heck out of Dodge. I don't know what you did when the canary took a nap, but that's a different story entirely. But what is the RAND, in essence? The RAND is telling us, in the simplest sense, money flow. If money is coming into South Africa, the foreign money has to buy the RAND, so the RAND goes stronger. Whether that money is coming into South Africa because they want to buy government bonds, because they want to buy JC shares, because they want to invest in, in, in unlisted businesses, or they want to build factories, or they want to come and visit our beaches, whatever the case, if money is coming in, RAND goes stronger. If money is going out, RAND goes weaker. My vote is, and, and for a decade, we saw money coming in. And we saw it coming in because we had a stock market that gave brilliant returns. We saw it coming in because we, we, we saw the, the, the tail end of the commodity boom and people were sending money in. That is starting to shift. Money is flowing out. And it's not, it's not because you know, the rest of the world worries about Julius Malema or anything. The rest of the world doesn't give a hoot about our politics. What they care about is can they make money? And if they can make money, they will invest anywhere in the world. And right now, the problem is they can make money in other, in other areas. They can go into the U.S. and invest into stock markets that are at all-time highs, the S&P that gave 35% last year. They can go into European markets, which are not as strong, but doing all right. They can go into Asian markets, South Korea, that are looking really, really strong. Uh, probably not Australia. Australia is suffering from the commodity uh, super cycle collapse as much as, well, as we are, but with different nuances to it. Short answer, money is exiting. That's why Iran goes weaker. And unless we can see a reason why the money stops exiting and starts flowing back in, the trend on the currency is weaker. So to me, the RAND goes weaker this year. And I'll keep my 1250 number and say we're going to hit 1250 at some point in 2015. And I warn you, if we don't, I'll keep that number for 2016 too. Hey? So, you know, you can tattoo it onto the back of my hand if you want, as long as it's not with indebable ink. The RAND tells us the story tells us investors are going elsewhere across the ambit of investment options. And they're going to continue going elsewhere. I mean, they absolutely are. So we, that, that trend is going to continue. That's not going to reverse anytime soon. We're going to see folks exiting, taking their money, putting it somewhere else. Net effect is going to be we're going to see a weaker currency. That's nice because I just told you to go and buy the international stocks. It does mean your trip to New York is now actually going to be a trip to Swaziland. Maputo. Maputo is a beautiful place. Go to, go to Mozambique. Keep it local. We can't afford uh, any of those fancy countries anymore. Those Western, go to Eastern Europe. That's cheap. You can get a beer in Prague for, for five crowns. What's that? About three bucks, fifty, four bucks. We're not going to New York anymore. Paris off the list. Those, those holidays, if we ain't done them, that's cool. Show your kids pictures off the internet. <laughs> Commodities. A part of that structural problem that is impending South Africa is alongside the union breakdown and alongside the ESCOM problem. And ironically, 
if we didn't have a meltdown in commodities, if commodities were still booming, our ESCOM problem would be significantly worse. We are currently consuming as much electricity as we did in 2007. We are currently making as much electricity as we did in 2004. And if we still had a commodity boom, we would, be make, we would need a lot more electricity to run those mines. They are huge consumers of electricity. The problem with commodities is really quite simple. We had a super commodity cycle. These things happen every so often. I don't know, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years. You get those crazy super cycles where crazy things happen, and we sought in commodities across the spectrum. Gold was the poster boy for it, but we sought with platinum. We sought with iron ore, went from $40 a ton to 160 We saw oil go from 30 a barrel to 150 Silver, I mean, silver, silver, come on, silver. Silver's not a commodity anymore. It's a jewelry. You know, back in the day, they used it for photographs, but we don't even do that anymore. It's ba uh, people say they want to invest in silver. Cool. Go to the Rosebank market, buy a bracelet. You've invested in silver. Even that went to levels that hadn't been seen since the Hunt brothers cornered the silver market in 1979-1980. Aluminium, nickel, pick a commodity. It was going insane. So what happens when commodities are going insane? People go and find more. They dig new holes, and they bring more production online. Because at $40 a ton, iron ore is a nice place to be. But at $160 a ton, everybody wants to be an iron ore maker. So what does Kumba Iron Ore do? They double production with their Kamela Mine. What does Anglo-American do who owns I uh, Kumba already? They go rushing off to South America for their Minas Rios, which takes twice as much and four times as long, or maybe four times as much and twice as long, whatever it was. It was a disaster. What does Exara do? Exara who do coal think, ah, oh, we'll go and do commodities. So what do they do? They go to Central Africa. They get the rights for a commodity mine, but they forget to get rights for a railroad to get the commodity to a port. Oops. Okay, well, that's 7.6 billion. We will just draw a line through and say, sorry, no one loses their job. If I lost 7.6 billion, I would expect to be fired. If you work for a commodity company, apparently it's just what, I mean, in fact, 7.6 billion is relatively small. Uh, Rio Tinto has written off closer to 100 billion and they work in dollars, not rand. So really 7.6 is small. But what happens is, classic issue, is when the price goes up, your supply goes through the roof because everyone suddenly is an iron ore miner. And the problem is you don't turn an iron ore mine on and off. It takes you years to develop and get it going and everything else. And then it starts to come in at exactly the time when the demand starts to fall off. So whereas you had rising demand and slowly rising supply, suddenly your supply starts to rise fast and your demand goes down. So you've gone from an undersupply to a chronic oversupply. And that's where we are now, across every commodity. The whole shambang, all the, the commodities out there, we have oversupply. And that oversupply does not disappear in a night. Everyone is hoping someone else will blink first. You close your mind. Come on, I dare you. We can see it with the platinum guys, right? They're all saying we're going to shut mines. Unless he does it first. And of course, he's saying, and I'm not falling for that trick. We're seeing it in iron ore. I mean, bulletin strategy with iron ore is really simple. This bulletin says, you know what we're going to do? We're going to flood the market. We're going to drive this price to $40. Why? Because that puts 80% of the producers out of the business. Then we will push the price higher. Now, you could call that price manipulation if you were doing that on the JSC, but if you're doing it with a the commodity, there's no problem. The other problem is who was using the commodities? China. China was building these vast railroads and cities and everything else, and now they've built them. That was a part of their evolution, and that part of the evolution is now over. China is now moving to the next part of the evolution. What's the next part of the evolution? Middle class. They're now building a middle class. And China got pillared. You know, oh, they're building stuff, and no one's there. They've got cities that are empty. But that's what you do with infrastructure. You don't build infrastructure when you need it. You build it when you don't need it because business will move into it. Business will expand into it. You don't build power when you have no power. You build power when you have too much power. Business will expand into it. And that's what's happening in China right now. The problem is they're not using so much commodities. Now they're turning them into consumers. So forget the miners, buy Richmond. British American Tobacco. Ah, no, they're not in China. Uh, Philip Morris is in China. Um, SAB Miller. Uh, that, that's the new economy that's coming through. NASPAS with Tencent. China is about the new economy. And you must understand what China did. In a decade, 
They took 350 people from a rural existence to an urban existence. 350 million people. That is more than the population of the USA. 350 million people. And they're going to take another 350 million in the next decade. That is 700 million new consumers on this planet in 20 years. We have never had in the history of Earth, in fact, let's go big, in the history of the universe, we have never had 700 million new consumers come to our market in 20 years, ever. Typically not even in 100. I don't know if we've ever had it. That is massive if you're in the right space. Now, you say Richmond, but those oaks, those 700 million can't afford a quarter of a million rand watch. Of course they can't. But if 1% of them can, I mean, the one percenters, understand 1% of 700 million is 7 million people buying a quarter of a million rand watch every year. You go to Beijing. So most watches that luxury goods at Richmond sells, they sell in Europe. Not to Europeans, because the Europeans are broke. They sell it to Chinese people. Why? Because if you're rich in China, you go to the Cartier store, but you have to queue. If you're really rich in China, you catch a plane to Paris where you go to the Cartier store where there's no queue. And I'm dinking. That's serious stuff. My brother-in-law went, he lives in south of France. You go to the Cartier store, the people behind the counter serving you speak Mandarin, not French. Well, they don't, the French can't afford that. Come on, they're French. They pay 50% tax, 75% super tax. So the commodity story is over for now. It'll come back. When? Ah, not next year. Understand the point I made a moment ago. Things happen slowly. Commodities are bad in 2015. They're going to be bad in 2016, probably 17, 18, 19, and 20. If that super cycle lasted a decade, well, the hangover from the super cycle, I don't know, my hangovers, maybe I'm old, are typically twice as much as, as long as the party. Commodities are a bad place to be. That's not good for us because we make a lot of money from commodities. We have more commodities under that ground in South Africa than anyone else in the world. We are the commodities superpower of planet Earth. There are two problems. We don't have the power to dig them out. And if we did, no one wants them. So commodities, not the place. And it's important to understand in a long-term portfolio, cyclical stocks do not have a place in a long-term portfolio. Yes, buy them, hold them, trade them, get out at the top. Single commodity producers are cyclical stocks. Uh, so Kumba, by 2009, Kumba's trading at 180. That's a buy. And then about two and a half years ago, when Kumba's trading at about 550, they come out with a trading update that say profits will be down 10%. The first time in a decade, their profits are falling. That's when you get the heck out of Dodge. Where's the Kumba share price going? At best, nowhere. And they're still going to pay you a great dividend yield. Their operating profit in Kumba Iron Ore is about 70% in the boom days and about 50% in the bust days. That leaves a lot of cash flow, a lot of dividends. But if your question is, is it going back to 600? The answer is yes, but do not hold your breath because you will turn blue. Not happening in a hurry. If, and I'm being brave when I say it will, but it, it probably will. So commodities, we stay away from single commodity producers. Bulletins, an interesting story. I'll touch on that in a moment. Interest rates. I'm being polite by saying going nowhere slowly because um, someone here is going to point out that Governor Marcus has been raising our rates for uh, a couple of times this year. But I went back and did some digging. And then it, in truth, I got bored because I kept on finding exactly what I thought I would find. So I stopped going back. So in 2011, all of the major financial houses around the world, JP Morgan, City Chase, Barclays and the like, in 2011, they told us that interest rates would go up in 2012, probably the second half. In 2012, all of the major banks around the world, JP Morgan, City Chase, Barclays, Deutsche Bank, told us that interest rates would rise the following year, probably in the latter half. Why do they say in the latter half? Because it gives them more runway. I mean, you notice my predictions are 2015, hey, not February. I've got the whole of 2015. So they're key. And then in, in 2012, they told us interest rates would rise in 2013. In 2013, they told us interest rates would rise in 2014. And in 2014, they told us interest rates will rise in 2015. And I'm telling you, they have been wrong every time and they will be wrong again next year. 
Governor Marcus, well, she's no longer the governor. Our new governor may or may not do some interest rate increases next year. They will be modest. We will not even get back to our long-term average on the prime interest rate. But if we look at Western Europe, if we look at North America, if we look at uh, Japan and those territories, they are not rising rates next year. Not going to happen. They are trying to create inflation desperately trying to create inflation and rising rates is not going to help with that. They also have economies that are doing somewhere between okay to, well, okay, and rising rates will not help those. Interest rates are not going higher. The fact that quantitative easing has finished in the U.S., is neither here nor there. It does mean that they're not pumping $40 uh, billion a month into the US economy, but they're pumping it in inversely by just having incredibly low interest rates. And anyway, uh, uh, Draghi and, and Japan are pumping in their own cash into the markets nonetheless. Quick point on quantitative easing. The question is, when does the Federal Reserve buy back the bonds? Oh, sorry, sell them back. They don't. So quantitative easing, what the Fed basically did was went and buy their own bonds. Now I've got this crazy balance sheet with trillions of dollars of US debt. But the average duration of those bonds is seven years. They don't sell it. They let it lapse. They just, quantitative easing fizzles out and eventually disappears. No big bang. It's the most boring ending you've ever seen. And then it becomes interest rates. Our global economy is not strong enough. We haven't got any indications of inflation, and we're not going to get any interest rate moves. So what does that mean? Cheap money remains. What does that mean? Global markets carry on going higher. In part, underpinned by some earnings, and in some cases, in bits of America, some decent earnings, Europe, some so-so earnings. And in part, the fact is, you've got money. You've got to do something with it. You can't put it in the bank. You don't earn anything. So what do you do? Well, you go and buy some equities, and therefore markets go higher. And that's what's been driving us for seven years, and broadly that story doesn't change anytime soon. Key difference, they were buying our equities, now they're buying their own equities. That's fine, we'll go buy theirs now too. I mean, two can play at this game, hey? So interest rates nowhere slowly. Bears will be bears always. There will always be people who are telling you that the world is horrible, that everything's going to end, and one day they will be right, and when they are, they will remind you of it in big, bold letters. Um, there are people who make a business out of being bearish. I suppose, in truth, there are people who make a business out of being bullish. Paul Theron springs to mind, and I'm not dissing Paul, but he makes a business out of being the internal bull, and a lot of folks make out of being an internal bear. We need to Firstly, accept that markets go up and down and that we will have a bear market at some point, but I think in a massively low interest rate environment, we don't. How do we get bear markets? Rising interest rates. Rising interest rates make bear markets. Why? Because interest rates rise and suddenly you can earn 5 or 6% putting your money in the bank, which is zero risk. Wow. Let's pretend it's zero risk. It isn't really, but let's give the bankers a credit moment of, of, of credit here. So it's zero risk. You can go put your money in the market and earn 6% zero, so in the bank, or you can put your money in the equities. So when interest rates are low, you're forced into the equity market because you don't get return in the cash market and the interest rate market. When interest rates rise, you start to get an option. And when interest rates rise higher enough, well, you're a fool if you go into the equity market because you're guaranteed, I understand in America, 5% is a crazy big number. You know, equivalent in South Africa. If our bank, if our banks are, offer, are offering you 14% interest rates, and you own equities, you're a fool because equities give you 15% on, on, on average, but with volatility. If you can get 14 in the bank, you sell your shares, you go put money in the bank, and that's what makes bear markets rising interest rates. But here's the caveat: not rising off a low base, rising to high levels. So the long-term average interest rate in America is around two and a half, two and a quarter percent, maybe two point three quarters. They're currently at 0.25. So when Janet Yellen stands up the first time and raises interest rates, and I think she'll do it by 0.1, you know, she's going to put that little pinky very carefully in the water. When she does it for the first time, the market will panic and there will be a sell-off and the world will end and we will go shopping. Because a 0.1% increase, or even a 0.25% increase is not important. When the U.S. rates get to 3, 3.5%, 4%, then our bear market comes. Every time. Every time, then we get it. And even if I'm wrong and interest rates do start rising, are we going to get 3% in America 
any time in the next two years? No. No. There are other way bear markets start, of course. Horrible things like subprime crises. Horrible things like 9-11. Horrible things like dot-com busts. But those are all the black swans. The known known of how bear market starts is rising interest rates. So that chap, he can go sit down and watch the Fed numbers. And as soon as those numbers start getting close to 2%, then maybe we start to get bear markets. Until then, not happening. Not going to happen at all. So those are the 10. South Africa is still expensive. Our price earnings are still around 17, 17 and a half in the top 40. Our long-term average is about 14 and a half. The long-term low is around about 11. Wayne McCurry, excuse me, earlier in the year was telling us that our market was the fifth most expensive it had ever been. Fifth. That's not exciting. Tell me it's the most expensive it's ever been. Then I'm excited and interested and maybe a little bit nervous. But we're certainly not a cheap market. Two things are happening. Our market is going nowhere. We peaked in the 4th of July of this year, and now five months later, we are kind of a 1,000 points below that peak, having gone trundling down in the, re in the meantime. But our market sort of lost the momentum broadly as the stock market. In a sense, we've still got action and excitement happening in the industrials. That's been set offset by collapsing prices in the resources. So we're pretty much going nowhere. Foreigners are going home. It's going to be about the rand. As I say, I, my long-term portfolio, not selling. I, mean, I can't believe it. ShopRite's over, above 170. Uh, Willie's is above 80. I mean, those are crazy numbers. But, but anyway, I, I don't sell because I'm not going to time it. I'm not trying to do that. I buy good stuff when it's cheap. But <clears throat> our market is not going to give us crazy returns over the next three years to my mind. Now, if we get double-digit average returns per year over the next three years, I think we've done good. And if we do, I think it's going to be helped by a weak rand. I, I go back to my weak rand hypothesis. We're still seeing SAB on, you know, above 20. We've still got the retailers. I mean, ShopRite, actually, I don't know. Now that it's at 170, it's probably around 20. Our, our stocks are not cheap. Uh, defensives should be, I mean, I sold British American tobacco on a 22 PE. You've got to be kidding me. A defensive stock growing at 4% a year should be in an 8 PE. That's why I sold it. Someone paid me three times what I think the crazy price is, and I'm like, hey, you know. The point is, when you buy expensive stuff, great to fool theory. You've got to find the next fool to sell it to, but don't leave it too late unless, because you might end up being the last fool. So South Africa, you know, I'm not, it, it's going to do nothing exciting. There will be some individual stocks. We will touch on those. The U.S. is chugging along. It's rocking. Unemployment is coming down. And I know the numbers. Unemployment is a fudged number. Unemployment tells you how many people who are looking for work are unemployed. It doesn't tell you how many people are unemployed but have given up looking for work. That's another story entirely. Unemployment's looking okay. Uh, the Republicans won the Congress. Ugh, it's just more politicians, really. Who cares? Um, they're going to fight and moan and complain and take home their salaries and work three-day. In fact, no, they work three-day weeks, but they only work 20-week years. So they work 60 days a year. By my reckoning, that's like March, and then you go home for the rest of the year. I mean, make me a congressman, yeah, please. Um, but the economy is working. They're growing. They're making jobs. They've had the longest streak of job creation since the 1990s. The economy is absolutely growing. Is it going to wobble from time to time? I hope so, because as long as it's wobbling, Janet Yellen won't keep the interest rates exactly where they are. We're going to see money flow into there. The U.S. is going to be, once again, the powerhouse. It is 26% of global GDP. It is going to save the rest of the planet, but as it has done many times before. Oddly enough, this might be the last time it saves us. Because our next crisis, as big as 2008, I am hoping, was like far away. And by then, China will be the dominant economy. And then China will save us. And that's going to depend on your Mandarin, isn't it? Top tip. Teach your kids Mandarin. Many ways we get exposure to the U.S. We go offshore, we buy U.S. stocks. We buy uh, IDX so futures on the JSC. We go and buy companies that make large amounts of their profit in the U.S. Only we have very few of those in South Africa. And we've got SAB, which makes some money there, and Richmond, which makes some money there. But most of our uh, uh, companies that did well either went north into Europe or east into Australia. And most who went to Australia came running home with a tail between their legs, with a few exceptions. Um, my preferred point there, my international exposure, I'd do real simple. A DBX tracker, DBX WD, stands for Deutsche Bank 
X-Tracker World. It gives you exposure to 6,000 global stocks. 6,000 is a humongous amount, of which about half of them are US, about a quarter of them are EU, about an eighth of them are UK and Japan, and then bits of Asia and the like. One entry, boom, nice and simple. You get currency exposure, you get global offshore exposure. And I like the tilt. I like the fact that it is half US. I like the fact that it is more EU than it is the UK. And I like the fact there's not too much Japan because I still can't understand Japan. A stock market that peaked at 39,000 in 1989 and is now at 16,000 just scares the beheckness out of me. I mean, you look at that chart and what does it tell you? <laughs> Forget everything. It's pumpkin and water seeds. Go live in the Drakensberg Mountains. There is no hope for anything. So that's one of my top positions. There is the DBX US, which is direct US exposure, 600 US shares, loosely tracks the uh, S&P 500. If you've got offshore accounts, you can go and buy the S&P 500 Spider, you can buy the Guggenheim S&P 500 tracker uh, and other such global funds. But from a JSC perspective, we're going to get global markets going forward. We're going to get weaker currencies. That is going to be one of the better performers over the next three to five years. Europe, we've got a DBX EU. I like, but I get enough EU. If I'm buying that, I'm not interested in having Europe. So I then go with, with the world instead. Europe is muddling along as Europe does best. Europe mostly muddles. And it mostly muddles because they've got like a European Union, which is uh, 27 countries. And then they've got European Monetary Union, which is 21 countries. And it's just complicated. And they can't seem to vote on anything. And it, it but you know what? They muddle along. They do all right. Germany will have good days and bad days, but broadly, Germany works incredibly well. Um, France never seems to work, but they seem to make money and, and, and muddle along perfectly good. Uh, Europe's doing fine. I mean, anyone remember the pigs? Portugal, Italy, Greece, Spain? Anyone still care about the pigs? No? I did a presentation here in June 14, 2012, two days, three days before the Greek election, where I said, no one, Greeks doesn't matter. I've never been so vilified in my entire life. I mention it because I was right. No one cares about Greece except the Greeks. As they should. I mean, but, you know, the pigs, Italy, Italy, no, no one cares about Italy. No one cares about Portugal, Spain, Greece, Ireland. No one cares. No one really, really cares. Those economies are tiny. We care about Germany. We care about France. We care about the US. We care about China. To a lesser degree, we care about the UK. The other EU countries are just not. So the, the, to put it in perspective, EU Monetary Union, which is 21 economies, which excludes the UK, uh, France and Germany is 78%. So who cares about Greece? And, and you know, and they make great feta, and Italy makes nice pizzas, and and we like our olive oil. But but beyond that, we don't really care. So locally, you want companies with offshore exposure. You want companies with lots of offshore exposure. My two picks, and uh, full disclaimer up front: uh, every share you see on there, I own. My portfolio is at SimonBrown.coza. When I buy and sell new shares, I update the portfolio. I was in, you know, within double quick time, not like a day later or a week later. I do update that. Uh, Richmond, I love it. I was buying it last week. I bought some at 92.10, and then I got some cheeky ones at 89.50. And when Richmond goes back to the low 90s or high 80s, I will buy more. I get currency exposure. I get watches to rich Chinese, and then some rich Yankees and 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 Europeans and French people as well. The story with 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 Richmond's really simple. It's a China story. So the big debate, which many people have been having, which I've been, to be perfectly honest, watching Jean-Pierre have for Stair from 361, because um, I daren't debate Jean-Pierre for Stair. Um, the big debate they were having was, so Richmond's having a bit of a tough time. And if you saw those results last Friday, they were not very good. The problem is, is that uh, there was a crackdown on gifting in China. Now, we don't call it gifting. We call it bribery. But anyway, there was a crackdown on gifting in China, and that hurt Richmond sales. And that, in the short term, is nasty. But the bigger picture is, as I explained to you earlier, 700 million people 
moved up into the middle class, one, some of those will become one percenters, and those one percenters are going to go and buy expensive watches and lighters and all the other stuff that Richmond sells, and that is a humongous market. It is a giant, it's twice America. It's bigger than America and Europe put together, and we still have America and Europe. What we have is a new America and Europe. That is massive. And we don't often get Richmond at what I consider to be a reasonable price. You never get Richmond at a cheap price. But the 90 bucks is about reasonable. MTN is uh, probably be the more risky of the space, and more risky for a very, very simple reason, because they love war zones. Well, not war zones. They love troubled countries. You know, ah, Iran. Yeah, give us Iran. Sudan. Oh, yeah, we like the idea of Sudan. Let's be honest. They originated in South Africa in 1994. There was a war zone for you. You know, Nigeria is probably their like calm country where they go for restful weekends. And they have challenges. They have challenges in Nigeria. They have challenges because the oil price goes down. So the Nara, which is a Nigerian can, a, a currency, weakens. So MTN weakens. I mean, figure MTN moved because oil moved. I, anyway, the point is 200 odd million subscribers. And without a shadow of a doubt, we know what the future is it is mobile. And it's not mobile telephone calls. Don't be silly. We've been ripped off on telephone calls. It is data. When I phone my sister, I Skype her over my phone. We talk for an hour, and it costs me like 11 cents. We're in different cities. We could be in different countries. We can't yet be in different planets, but that's only because there's no one on any other planet. So MTN is going to have some trouble times. MTN at 210, 215, I'm buying it. I'm going to stress that just because I'm buying it doesn't mean it can't be lower. Hey, It just means that at that price, I like the price I'm paying for a company I like. And if I buy it at 210 and it goes to 100, what do I do? I buy more until eventually I run out of money. <laughs> do I one day sell these shares? Maybe. If there's a fundamental change. If something comes along that says the future is not mobile data, Okay, then I sell it. But if the future's not mobile data, what is it? I have no clue. It's a black swan. I'll tell you, I'll know it when I see it. And if it turns out that 700 million Chinese people don't buy Richmond product, well, then I made a mistake and I sell my Richmonds. But I'm betting that some of them will buy expensive watches and the like. Single commodities, miners, stay away. Stay away. Once more for effect, stay away. That includes Xara. Stay away. Are they cheap? Yes. Why are they cheap? Because their costs are rising, their commodity prices are falling, and they've got labor disputes coming. Stay away. Unless you don't like your money, in which case I can give you a great charity. Then you will get a warm feeling in your heart, a nice little card thanking you for your money. <laughs> just saying. Single commodity, just stay away. Billiton is interesting. So I own Billiton. And then at 11 PE, I look at it and I think, oh, it's cheap. Ooh, it's so cheap. And what does it do? Iron ore, ouch. Energy, ooh, ouch. Potash, okay, potash is nice. We have to eat. I, 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 short answer, I'm not buying Billiton at the moment. I own it. I hold it. I don't know where it's going to make a large amount of money from in the next three years or so except maybe someone comes and buys it. But if anything, it's the buyer. I like their new strategy. I like their focus on four key pillars. I like what they're doing in the iron ore space, essentially bullying and driving people out. If you've heard me speak before, I say, or it depends on the presentation, but I use the analogy, buy winner stocks and winner sectors. Why? Because winners keep on winning. Why? Because they bully everybody else. That's what Billiton is doing. They are using their iron ore deposits in Australia to bully an entire global industry of iron ore and to drive the price down and get competitors out. That's what winning companies do. And it works slowly. So Billiton right now, yeah. And if you, I mean, Anglo-American, no, don't be silly. They are just, no, I mean, come on, platinum, yeah, iron ore, mm, diamonds, no, no. Um, SA Inc. <sighs> You've got to be very, very careful with the South African shares that we buy, ergo to what I said earlier in the presentation. We have to be immensely selective. Do many of them have great stories? Yes. Are many of them doing very well? Yes. The question we have to ask ourselves, if you're not going offshore, what does your future hold internally? The three I've got there, of which I own, all Capitec, an easy story. 
I've told this one before. My bank account costs 285 Rand per month before I transact. And once a year, my private banker phones me my birthday. And he phones and he says, hello, my name is Dum Dum. And I'm like, who are you? I'm your private banker. Oh, yes, I've got a private banker. I must remember this. I must write the number down. So I do. And I only know this because it was my birthday 10 days ago or 12 days ago. And he phoned me. This is why I know. If, it's, if I'd done this presentation two weeks ago, I would have forgotten I had a private bank. I had 285 rand. I can go to Capitec and the account would cost me 5 rand 60. You know what would happen? I wouldn't get a phone call on my birthday. That is the most expensive phone call in the world. <laughs> cost me 290, 79 rand and 40 cents per month. So that some person whose name I forget can phone me on my birthday. Yeah, you see the logic and the logic. Uh, anyway, Capitec are killing the big four banks. Very simply, they cost their income ratio is about 35%. The big four banks cost their income ratio is about 55%. The big four banks can talk the talk. They can say they would want to do low-cost banking. They can do the survey thing with solidarity and make it look like they're the cheapest bank out there. The point is they can't do it. They simply can't do it. Their cost structure is about 60% higher than Capitec. They cannot compete. Capitec is eating their lunch. The big banks will survive, but they're going to be decimated by Capitec. Capitec will have 10 million clients. They're currently on three or four. They will have 10 million clients in the next five years. And where do you think those clients come from? And it might not be me yet, but one morning I'm going to wake up and realize that I'm just a fool. That I'm throwing away 279 rand and 40 cents. And that is, I mean, that is like five bottles of decent wine every month. That's like a bottle a week and two on the last day of the month. Why? So that I can have a, uh, no. So, so right now my excuse is they don't offer me what I need. Which is also a lie because I don't, I mean, they do. They'll do home loans very soon. I don't have a car loan. Capitec is going to eat their lunch. You, we look at 300 Rand and we think it's expensive. The point is a stock that can rise 150 times in 12 years can do it again. I'm not saying it will, but don't be scared just because it's run. People have been calling Capitec expensive since 5 Rand. It's now 300. Kogra M3 makes houses, low cost, low income houses, high quality houses, proper houses, not four by four RDP houses, the real McCoy. And they don't build the house until the person who is buying it has got the money for the house. I don't need to say anymore. In fact, I could just stop that Kogra M3 build houses. Do not go and buy RBA, do not go and buy CK because they do not build houses, they are bankrupt. KP Tech do it and make money. And then famous brands. So we look at famous brands and we see Burger King and the Q's and we see Domino's Pizzas and we see uh, uh, Pizza Hut coming back and everything else. Yes, 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 and yes. But I'm reminded of something Whitey Basson said when MassMart came in, when Walmart bought MassMart. And I was interviewing Whitey Basson and I said to him, Mr. Basson, because calling someone Whitey seems a little weird in South Africa. <laughs> so I said to him, Mr. Basson, uh, are you worried about MassMart, Walmart? Do you think we could learn some lessons from Walmart? And he said to me, young man, we will teach Walmart a thing or two about retail. And four years on, he has taught Walmart a thing or two about retail. In fact, he has whipped their butt and sent them almost home packing. And Kevin Hedwick is going to do the same. He is going to eat their lunch. He's far too smart an operator. Notwithstanding, he has done an incredibly smart deal in Central Africa. Everyone thinks it's Nigeria, Mr. Biggs, but it's actually Nigeria, it's Ghana, it's Uganda, it's a little bit in Rwanda, where he bought 49% of a business, which is weird because he doesn't like to have minorities. He typically wants 51. But what did he do? He bought a distribution network and a central kitchen. And Famous Brands is not really about the burgers we eat. Well, it is, but what it really is, is the central kitchen and distribution network. And that's why Grand Parade bought 10% of Spur. That's why Taste is going to struggle, not immensely struggle, but it's going to be hard for Taste to roll out Deb uh, the, the Domino's Pizza because they don't have the distribution network. It's about moving things around. Property remains expensive. Uh, far too expensive, and I'm not thrilled by it. Retail is weird. Retail is running. Retail has gone crazy in the last two weeks, and I can't understand why. I love it. I have some retail shares, Woolies and ShopRite. Um, 
So what the retail prices are telling us is that in the next 12 to 18 months, there's going to be a consumer revival and we will all be rich again. I don't see it. Firstly, next year, Minister Nene is going to stand up for his first budget speech and he is going to raise taxes for the rich people. Fair enough. Um, and then he's going to stand up in February of 2016 for his second budget speech and Minister Nene is going to raise taxes. So I'm not sure where this money is all coming from. Social grants are not going to get much bigger because the government hasn't got the money to increase social grants by very much. So I'm deeply suspicious. The only thing is, is that what we have seen, and it's counterintuitive, and everyone says it's not true, but if you go and read the South African Reserve Bank quarterly bulletin, the numbers are absolutely there in black and white. South African household debt has been coming down. We have been reducing our exposure to debt. You know why? I think because the banks have stopped lending. I think we still ask for debt. We still queue. And in fact, if you talk to Capitec, so they, 100 people walk into a Capitec branch, 36 get offered a loan, but only 19 accept it because 17 of them didn't like the loan they were offered. So I think the reason our, our, our household debt is coming down is not because we don't want more, but because we can't get more. Fine, whatever the case. So maybe that's the story. I'm not convinced by this retail running. I do not think, I, I, I'm not convinced by it at all. I think retail is still a tough space. Retail may be a buy in a year or two, but right, not right now. Preference shares are attractive, but boring. They give you no capital appreciation, but they give you a fair level of certainty as long as you didn't buy the African bank one. They give you a dividend linked to the prime interest rate, which is attractive. Prime will probably in the next two years go up another percent maybe, half a percent next year, half a percent the year after. You're going to get a little bit more. So if you're looking for somewhere to park money, if you're looking for some security, preference shares are possibly a place to look at. The key thing with them is they have a notational value. So for example, the Standard Bank, the SB, SBKP, has a notational value of 100 Rand. That's the debt value of it. And it should trade at 100 Rand plus accrued interest. And then when it pays out the interest, it goes back to 100, and every day it adds the interest to it. If it doesn't happen, it trades in the low 90s. In other words, be crafty where you buy it. You want to buy the SB, P, SB ah, Standard Bank preference, yeah? You go and put a crafty bid in at like 9120 and leave it for a week or two and wait for someone to hit you. In essence, you're buying money at discount. Of course, that's useless because you can't sell it at its real price, but you're getting it at a, at, a, at a discount to the cash. Nice place to park. What you don't get is capital appreciation, and your risk is Standard Bank goes, goes African bank on you. And if Standard Bank goes African bank on you, as I always say, we have bigger problems. We are trying to get a, into, you know, we're queuing to get into Zimbabwe. And then cyclical stocks. Uh, the, the point with preference over money in the bank is that you get a higher yield and you get a dividend. So it's 15% dividend withholding tax. Money in the bank, interest above a certain amount, pay at your marginal tax rate, potentially 40%. You've got to run the numbers for your own personal experience, but typically preference shares work. The cyclicals, as a rule, avoid them always. So what are your cyclicals? Construction stocks. Because what do construction stocks do? Nothing. Just nothing. Just nothing, nothing. And then one day they go like, doom, hit the roof, and then the next day they're back down again. And if you blinked, you missed it. So you buy the construction stock and you wait. And 10 years later, it moves, and you are out having a cup of tea, and you missed the move. I have literally, since 2010, been bullish on construction, bearish, bullish, bearish. I just now don't buy construction. There's an exception, Afrimat, expensive, but, but that is your exception. There is no other construction stock worth buying, unless you like... Very, very boring and then extremely insane rights. Uh, single commodity miners are your cyclicals. The problem with cyclicals is that we, we wait too long for them to do something. And then when they do do it, we forget to sell. And before we know it, they're back where we started. Marion Roberts went from 6 to 106 to 20. And you think, well, if I sold at 20, I would have made 300%. Yes, you would have made 300% over 10 years. And if you'd been invested in the market over that time, you would have made 700%. Just buying an ETF. So cyclicals we stay away from. There's some interesting ones. SAPI is an interesting one, and I can't believe I'm going to actually say something nice about a paper stock. SAPI is interesting not because they're selling paper, for goodness sake, that would be silly, and not because they're selling the, the, the sucrose stuff they make out in Pumalanga, because that also would be crazy, because the cotton prices come down and sucrose goes into plastics, so people are using cotton as their fabrics and stuff. So they're not actually selling anything but they're getting their debt down. 
in part because they found a tax credit in a draw from four years ago, and that saved them $50 million. And the point being is their debt's going down, and they're refinancing the new old debt at new rates, and the new rates are half the price of the old rates. All this means that their interest bill has gone down, and ergo, their profit has gone up. So SAP is up from like 30 to 45 Rand. And if you really want to buy a cyclical stock, SAP is probably it. It can probably go to 60 or 70 or 80. Um, don't forget to sell because it will go back to 30. Guaranteed. Because really, no one wants paper. I know you're all writing on paper, but aside from that. I'm going to park that there for now. I've got one or two more thoughts as well, but I'm running time and I want to take some questions. The last one I want to quickly touch on is a core ETF portfolio. Core ETF portfolio, I leave it. I never sell it. I just I buy them. I leave them as they are nice and simple. Uh, your offshore, as I said, looking good. I particularly like the US. The weaker rand helps. The DBXWD is my preference in that point. Uh, yep, struggling. It's about rand. It's dual hedges, it's offshores. If I hold Kruger Rands, what would I do with them? You must always have one Kruger Rand because when you need to toss a coin, you pull out a Kruger Rand, you intimidate the heck out of your opposition. Um, I would sell them. I, and I must preface that I've never liked gold. For a long time as gold was going up, I was wrong. And now that it's going down, I'm right. The, the case for gold was end of world. We saw it. April, sorry, August, uh, August uh, 6, 2011, Friday evening, the, the S&P Standard & Poor's downgrades the U.S. from AAA plus to AAA. Huge panic that weekend. The uh, Monday, gold spikes to 1,911, as it's supposed to do because if the U.S. has been downgraded, the world is ending. Only it didn't, and since then it's been in a massive bear trend. And if the crisis of 2008 can't take gold to new highs in, in inflation-adjusted terms, what the hell do we need to get gold to move? Because 1911, it hit 850 in 1980, 1911 and 2011, you've lost out in terms of inflation. If the 2008 crisis, the worst crisis of our entire generation, can't get gold to new highs, what will? I, I, I don't know. I, 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 I have no idea. So my vote is yes. So shale gas is interesting. And, and I mean, shale gas is definitely a new find. And there are some environmental issues. I'll touch on those in a second. Shale gas is the real deal. Um, we can get it out fairly cheaply. It turns out there is a crazy large amount there. And much of it is fairly accessible. The problem with oil, a lot of it's not accessible. There's oil off the Brazilian coast, like crazy amounts of oil. But first you go through five kilometers of water. Then you go through five kilometers of rock. And by then you're almost at the core of the earth. And now you've got to get the oil out. And it's like hard and complicated. Shale gas and then folks like Sassel come along and they turn it into oil and everything. So shale gas is the real deal. And it's giving America energy independence. It has implications for oil itself. Um, I think oil at 100, 110, 115 was crazy. I think oil at about 60 is about right. I hold Sassel. I'm comfortable holding my Sassels at this point. The trick with shale gas is the abundance of it might be its downfall and that there's just too much. And then the environmental impacts and issues around it. And the mining companies will, with all respect to the mining companies, lie. They will tell you the stuff is harmless. Of course they must, because they have to dig it out the ground so they can sell it and make some money. To me, it's a bigger issue. I love the crew and everything else. But you know what? If we can make South Africa energy independent, I reckon we can give up half the crew. Maybe. I don't know. Quarter? No, no support? Okay, I'll move on from that. <laughs> no, what is one of our biggest foreign expenses? Oil. Imagine if we could get shale gas at five cents a barrel instead of oil at $90 a barrel. I love the crew. Okay, still no support. Moving on. Shale gas is real. Um, immediately, companies benefiting from it locally. Sassel with the ethane cracker plant in Louisiana. I have no idea what ethane cracker is, but I love the phrase. Um, they're spending a large amount of money. That includes a large amount of risk because projects take longer and cost more. Always. That is guaranteed. But shale gas is a real deal. And it is going to change the face of energy. It's, gonna, it's not going to supplant oil anytime soon but it is going to have some significant impacts. For example, making America energy independent, which then has implications into Saudi Arabia because the oil price is lower and then geopolitical and then all sorts of fun and games. But I own the Sassel show. I'm not selling it. I was buying Sassel at 610. I was buying Sassel at 595. I, like I bought my first Sassels at 16 Rand 20 odd years ago. Um, I hold on to Sassel. The story for oil 
shale gas has not killed oil yet. Will it in time? Maybe. If it does, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Plenty of time. Plenty of time. Ladies and gents, we'll leave it there because I have hit my time and overrun it. And worse, uh, legal disclaimers, if you make money, it's yours. If you lose money, no longer yours. <laughs> Short version, South Africa, Inc. is going to be tough for a long time. The global market is recovering. There is money to be made. We should not hide under our beds and play chicken licking. We should go out there and make money. Last power hour, as Takalani said, we'll be back in February. We will have speakers. I will be back at the end of the year uh, to tell you how I did with this year's predictions and my predictions for 2016. I can tell you my first prediction for 2016, Rand, 1250. Feedback forms, please. Give them to Rolf on your way out. Ladies and gents, thanks very much for your time this evening.